Well, greetings, everyone. This is Mike Howard, and we're in a Bible study. This is the book of Isaiah, and we're in the last section. This will be our last lesson on Isaiah. We'll start with Luke next week. It's an exciting lesson. I hope you enjoy it. And so let's go ahead and get started. Book of Isaiah, chapter 65, uh, God Restores is the title of the lesson. Uh, to go back and do a little review, there are four main themes that Isaiah develops in his sermons, songs, and poems, uh, and prophecies throughout his book. Those four themes are a theme of rebellion, and that is the, 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 the nation Judah uh, that he was the prophet for rebelled against God, turned away from God, as well as the northern kingdom, as well as all nations, as well as everybody that's ever been born has turned away from God. So we, a theme of rebellion, we've turned away from God. A theme of exile, because of that rebellion, God sends the northern kingdom and then later the southern kingdom into exile away from the promised land. And in this case, it's represented by the, the city of Jerusalem. Uh, but we also know that uh, there's a plan for redemption. So the, the nation of Judah comes back into the promised land. And, as, and because of that, we also know that there's a plan for redemption for all of us who have wandered away from God. So in the middle of all that, there's God's judgment. And that is sprinkled throughout the book of Isaiah, where he judges not only uh, his people, uh, Israel and Judah, but he also judges the surrounding nations. And ultimately he judges the entire world. And he calls that event, this final judgment event, the dreadful day of the Lord. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to get into that in just a little bit. But ultimately and eventually there is redemption for those who are God's chosen people. And he talks about that happening through uh, his servant, uh, the anointed one, the Messiah, that we know that person as Jesus Christ, we as Christians. So uh, let me go back and take a little review of, uh, of Isaiah. First of all, he lived 2,700 years ago, 700 years before Christ, and he was a prophet to the southern kingdom of the, the kingdom of Judah, which is mostly the tribe of Judah. He was warning them about their impending exile because they rebelled against God. But he also predicted that their event, they would eventually be returned to their promised land or they'd be restored. So right up front, we get the, the, uh, the pattern of exile and redemption. Now, he gave a prophecy for the judgment and the, dis and the destruction of other peoples, and he keeps that prophecy throughout uh, the book of Isaiah. But he ends with uh, this great restoration, this ultimate restoration, which is called a new creation that's going to bring eternal peace and fellowship with God. And we know that as heaven. Uh, so a, cr a new created, a recreated earth and a recreated heaven and God living with us uh, in Jesus Christ. These things are going to be brought about, like I said, by the Messiah, the anointed one. So we have discovered some interesting things that Isaiah prophesied about this, this servant, this prophet, uh, this Messiah, a person that God is going to use for this restoration. Uh, we learned, for example, that he was born, he was to be born of a virgin like the Virgin Mary. And we also learned that he was going to minister in this weird place called Galilee, and he did. And then he's going to be gentle, kind, and merciful, which uh, originally uh, uh, the Messiah was perceived, and rightfully so in his second coming, as this uh, great warrior riding on a white horse with uh, 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 the sword of the Spirit coming out of his mouth to slay all the people that had been disobedient. But this particular incarnation, the Christ comes as a loving, gentle, kind Messiah. We also know that he was, would be rejected by his own people and he would be killed and then he would live again. He would be resurrected. And then we find out a little bit later in Isaiah that he, didn't, he doesn't just come. His only purpose isn't just to bring back the nation of Israel and Judah. Uh, his purpose ultimately is much bigger than that. It is to bring all people back to God. So we learned all of those things about the Messiah in our study. So God restores. Let's take a look. Isaiah finishes his, his book by telling of a new creation, a place that is restored to what God originally intended before uh, sin entered into the world. There would be no death. There, would be, there will be no wars. There will be no disease, no more hunger, uh, no more crying, uh, weeping. Uh, uh, it's just going to be a, 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 pace, a place of peace and happiness, and we're, we're going to dwell with our Creator. 
However, we know from Revelation chapter 20 that this prophecy of this redemption, of this restoration actually comes in two stages or it comes in two parts. And when one of the reasons I think that the Jews rejected Jesus uh, because he uh, ultimately died, uh, they crucified him. I think the reason that they to this day don't believe uh, that he is the Messiah is because they couldn't see a Messiah that died. Uh, they saw a Messiah that would never be uh, one who would die. And so uh, they couldn't see the death of Jesus. All they could see was the second coming of this Messiah. And I think the trouble that we get into here when we talk about this new creation is we see it as one new creation, not as a stage of creation. So I'm going to take you through that. And by the way, I do not have a PhD in, uh, in Bible study. In uh, end times. <laughs> what? In end times. Yeah, I don't have a, <laughs> yeah. And Beverly will tell you that um, my knowledge of end times is fairly limited, uh, but I do know what the lesson tells us today. Mm -hmm. So I hope you enjoy it. Part one, therefore, of this restoration is something called the millennial reign, or it's the thousand-year reign of Christ, the return of Christ for the thousand-year reign. Part two, then, is the final battle. You remember that Satan was released from his pit, and the total removal of the current universe and the new heavens and the new earth come into being. In other words, he destroys everything that has currently been created, uh, where we currently live, and he recreates all of that into a new heavens and a new earth. And it's going to be similar uh, but different. And for example, there's not going to be any ocean. There won't be any oceans. Uh, and by the way, when the world was first created, we know because of the flood of Noah that there weren't oceans then either, which made Noah building a ship even more perplexing, I'm sure, to the people of his time. So we, his people, are going to, in part two, we're going to live there with him forever. So uh, <clears throat> let's go ahead and get started. We're in chapter 65 and verse 17 where God says through Isaiah, see, I'm going to create a new heaven, the new heavens and a new earth. The former things that be our current creation are not going to even be remembered, nor will they come to mind. And so for those of us living in this new creation, uh, we really won't even think about uh, our earthly life, the, the life that we had before. But be glad, he says, and rejoice forever in what I will create. For I will create Jerusalem to be a delight and its people to be a joy. Now, he's going to bounce. Uh, we did that in a, in a, a couple of lessons ago where he starts out talking about the suffering Messiah. And he starts out with a verse that says he's going to be highly lifted up and exalted. And then he goes on to talk about a Messiah that was going to suffer and die and then be raised again. And he does the same thing here. He starts off by talking about this new heaven and new earth, which is the ultimate new heaven and new earth. And now he's gonna go, he's gonna take a step back into this millennial kingdom where Christ comes and reigns for a thousand years. He says, be glad and rejoice forever in what I will create, for I will create Jerusalem to be a delight. And let me, it'll become clear why I think this is the millennial reign and his people a joy. I will rejoice over Jerusalem and I'm going to take delight in my people. The sound of weeping and crying will be heard in it no more. Now that sounds like heaven, but there are some details that we're about to get to that would imply that what God has done is he's created a, a version of this new creation in Jerusalem for this thousand year reign. He says, I heard in it no more. Never again will uh, there be in it an infant who lives but a few days or an old man who does not live out his years. The one who dies at 100 is gonna be thought to be merely a child, and the one who fails to reach 100 will be considered a curse. Now here's where we get the, uh, I think the information that, that lets us understand that this is, this millennial kingdom is actually a Christ's kingdom on this earth, on this creation uh, with flesh. We, we will be still be people but it's going to be a, a pattern of the new creation, the new world. And the reason I say that is there is still death in this kingdom. Read with me. He says, uh, uh, there will not be a, in it a, an infant who lives only a few days or an old man who does not live out his years, the one who dies. So there's death in this little millennial kingdom, which means that it was still part of this, this fractured sinful earth, but it is a place where things begin to look a lot like they looked before the flood. For example, anybody who dies 
uh, at 100 is going to be thought to be a mere child. And <laughs> what that means is, and you remember these stories of, of people like Noah and Methuselah, Methuselah and Noah and people in that age lived to be hundreds and hundreds of years old, five, six, seven, eight hundred years old. And we're going in this millennial kingdom, people are going to go back to that. They're, they're going to return to those extremely long lives. Anybody who dies at 100 is going to be thought to be a mere child, and the one who fails to reach 100 will be considered accursed. A they will build houses. Now, we know, for example, that we don't build houses in the new creation. Jesus says, I am going to a place to prepare a place for, for you. you. Mm -hmm. So Jesus is preparing our permanent heavenly home. He's going to do that. Now, as we live on this earth today, he is preparing our hearts to live in a place that he's prepared us to live. So he's getting us ready for the new house. But in this millennial kingdom, it says they, being the people who live in the Jerusalem, uh, in the city of Jerusalem, they're going to build houses and they're going to dwell in them. They will plant vineyards and they're going to eat their fruit. No longer will they build houses and others live in them. In other words, nobody's going to come as an enemy and try to take over or plant and others eat. For as the, day, as the days of a tree, so will be the days of my people. In other words, they're just going to live for a very, very long time. So will be the days of my people. My chosen ones will enjoy the work of their hands. It's going to be a, it's going to be a replica of heaven is what it sounds like. It's going to be a, an earthly version of a heavenly place. They will not labor in vain, nor will they bear children. Once again, this is the evidence that he's talking about a millennial kingdom. They will not bear children. We know from Jesus that nobody gets married in heaven and therefore no children in heaven. At least that's what I'm thinking. Bear children doomed to misfortune for they will be a people blessed by God and they and their descendants are going to live with them. Before they call, I will answer. While they are still speaking, I'll hear. God will be present with them in this millennial kingdom. Jesus will be there. You'll have all these martyrs that were killed before he will have raised uh, to rule with him in this kingdom. And it says, all before you can even get the prayer for your need out of your mouth, God's going to say, got it taken care of, no problem. And today, sometimes we get the feeling that maybe sometimes God isn't listening to us or God can't hear us. And not in the millennial kingdom. In the millennial kingdom, it's going to be a God is promising here that he is going to hear you when you speak. And then he says something very interesting. He says, the wolf and the lamb are going to feed together and the lion will eat straw like the ox. And we know that's going to be the case in the future kingdom, the forever kingdom, the new creation. But we also see it here in this millennial kingdom. Uh, and dust will be the serpent's food. Uh, I don't believe there are going to be serpents in the, in the new creation. Uh, at least there's not going to be any devils. I know that. There will, they, they will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountains, says the Lord. Now, <clears throat> That's my version of how to interpret Isaiah chapter 65, that there's this millennial kingdom and that it's going to be a kind of a heaven on earth during that time. Now, what's the purpose? Why would God do something like this? And now I'm getting off into the hypothetical. Uh, one reason I can think of is uh, we've just gone through, according to Revelation, we've just gone through the tribulation. A lot of people, I mean, maybe three-fourths of the people on the earth, maybe five or six, we don't know how many people are going to be alive at that point in time, but like 70, 80% of the people that were alive are going to have died from some sort of horrible condition or another, a disease or a famine or something like that. We saw all of these things being poured out. And so there's going to be the, the remnant of people there. And I think, this is just in my opinion, but I think that God will set this millennial kingdom up uh, as one final attempt to allow people to turn back, to come back to God, to return. Uh, the first time that people rejected the Messiah, uh, they killed him. Uh, I think the second time they're rejecting the Messiah is the age that we're living in right now, uh, where you tell people the good news and they either believe in Christ as their savior or they reject him. And I think the third time that they're going to reject the Messiah, or at least have an opportunity to accept the Messiah, will be during this millennial kingdom period. So 
Let's go take a closer look at how I got to all this stuff. And we're going to start in Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 through 5, because that's where uh, John gets the vision of this millennial kingdom. It says, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand a key to the bottomless pit and a great chain with him. And he seized the dragon, that's the ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and he bound him for a thousand years. So, uh, this angel is going to come down with a key to the pit and a key to a lock uh, and a chain to bind Satan. And he's going to throw Satan into this pit uh, for a thousand years. So Satan will not be allowed to tempt or to deceive anybody. Remember, this is after there's already been the Antichrist and the beast and all of that's happened. Now the world is not going to have the Antichrist. The world is not going to have the beast. The world is not going to have Satan. There won't be these, these demonic forces trying to deceive people. So God is making the, the playing field really level here for those who want to turn to him and be saved. Uh, <clears throat> And he threw him, this is the angel, throws Satan into the pit and shut it and he sealed it over him so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years ended. After that thousand years, he must be released for a little while. And that period where he's released is going to lead up to the, to the battle of Armageddon. Then I saw thrones and seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. Also, I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God. And these are the martyrs throughout the ages. And those who had not worshiped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands, they came back to life. They were re re uh, uh, resurrected and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So those are gonna be the, the, the ruling people uh, that rule with Christ for a thousand years during this, this period of time. The rest of the dead, uh, those who weren't martyred, uh, won't be raised uh, to life until the thousand years is over, until the new creation, the new heaven and the new earth is prepared. And so this time that he's speaking of here, uh, he calls that the first resurrection. So there will be two resurrections. There'll be the resurrection of the martyrs who will rule with Jesus for a thousand years. And there'll be a second resurrection, and that'll be for everybody else that wasn't martyred uh, uh, during this period of time. So now we get to the new heaven and the new earth. So what I've done is I've split this up, according to Revelation, into a prophecy of the millennial reign when there still is death, people are still having babies, people are still building houses, people are still planting vineyards, uh, and then the new heaven and the new earth, which is, we all know, uh, a brand new creation. So in Revelation 21, this is after the thousand year reign, after Satan was readmitted to the, uh, to the world, uh, there's gonna, he's going to lead all the nations against Israel, and then there's going to be this great battle of Armageddon where there will be nothing but dead people everywhere, uh, anybody who comes after uh, that kingdom. Revelation 21, verses 1 through 4. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth now has passed away, and there was no longer any sea. So now it's been restored back to uh, the way God first created the earth in, in the beginning. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride. And this is the, the living space. This is the mansion that Jesus has gone ahead to prepare for us. Now it's coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He's going to wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death. Okay, so even though people in the millennial era live for five, six, seven, eight hundred years, in this particular new creation, nobody's going to die at all. This is like Adam and Eve. They weren't created for death. They were created to live forever. No more death, no more mourning, no more crying, no more pain. For the old order of things, the way things were in our current day, that has passed away now. It's completely passed away. So, summary. Many of Isaiah's prophecies have already come to pass. 2,700 years ago, Isaiah wrote this book. It's a collection of his sermons, it's a collection of his prophecies, their songs, their poems, but it was 2,700 years ago. The exile in Babylon that he prophesied about happened. 
the return from Babylon 70 years later took place. The birth, the ministry, the death, and the resurrection of the anointed one, the Messiah, happened 700 years after he wrote this book. All of these things were prophesied in the book of Isaiah. All of these things have come to pass. However, there are other prophecies, such as the one we just read, that are yet to be fulfilled. But my point here is this. If all of those came to pass, so much so that 80-something times Isaiah is quoted in the New Testament uh, as, as, you know, this proves that Jesus was the Messiah because Isaiah said this, if that happened, if Isaiah is a true prophet, and he is because all of those things have come to pass, he's predicting then in the future these other things. The first thing is a coming judgment. We know from Revelation that it's going to be a tremendous judgment called the tribulation. But that's not the final judgment. We're also told in both Isaiah and in Revelation that everybody who's ever lived is going to be resurrected to life and stand before the throne of God. And he's going to go through them one by one. That's Yes, it's currently estimated to be 108 billion people who have lived from the beginning of Adam and Eve to now. 108 billion people. They're all going to stand before God, and God's going to take a look at their life. And it says here that they're going to be separated, Jesus says, into two groups. There's going to be a group that he calls the sheep. Those are his people, and a group that he calls the goats. And the way that they're separated is because he'll look into a book called the Book of Life. And if those whose names are in the Book of Life will in fact be put into the group called his people, and those who aren't will be put into another group. And they will be sent to a place forever with Satan called that we call hell uh, to suffer. And it's termed as a lake of fire, a lake of suffer, an eternal punishment, uh, you name it. But that's prophesied in Isaiah and we explained in more detail in the book of Revelation. So our conclusion, we know, therefore, we tell and we prepare. Those are the two things that we get to do here on this earth. Like Isaiah and Jesus, we do now know because we've been told by Isaiah and we've been told by Jesus what's coming. So we need to tell people about the coming judgment and the good news of salvation through faith in Christ but we must also prepare for an eternity uh, by living godly lives. That's the light that we bring into a dark world is by living a life that reflects our faith in a God who is loving, just, graceful, forgiving. And we must be that in a place that doesn't see any of that as valuable. But at the final judgment, that will be part of what God uses to show them that they have missed the boat. So we must prepare, we must tell, and we must prepare. Well, that's the book of Isaiah. It's been a great study. Uh, I've really enjoyed it, and I'm glad that you were able to uh, join me in the, in the study. So uh, let's go ahead and pray before we go. Father God, thank you for the book of Isaiah. Thank you for the visions that you gave and the prophecies that you gave to Isaiah so that he could share those not only with the people of the nation Judah, but also with the nation Israel for Jesus to come. And Father, how accurate those prophecies are. So Father, knowing what's coming, knowing what is facing this creation, Father, help us to be the lights that we need to be in this world. Help us, Father, to become more godly, to follow more closely to repent of all the things that this world would drag us into so that we can be prepared for the home that you are preparing for us. Father God, thank you that you have saved us through Jesus, our Messiah. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. Well, I'll see you next week when we start the book of Luke. Uh, that also is going to be exciting. It's a narrative story, so I get to get back into uh, looking at things from a storybook perspective. So uh, until then, we hope you stay safe. Uh, by the way, there's a new vaccine.
Uh, there are two companies that have one, and we're hoping that by next spring or perhaps next, as late as next summer that we'll have uh, this virus totally under control and we'll all be able to get back together uh, face to face. So until then, know that we love you and we miss you. Take care. Bye-bye.